so good morning, everyone. Uh, let me welcome you to the New America Foundation. Uh, my name is Benjamin Lennett, and I direct the policy team here at the Open Technology Initiative. Uh, before I turn it over to Alex to get us started, let me just say a few words about New America. Uh, new America is a public policy uh, institute that invests in new thinkers and new ideas to address the next generation of policy challenges facing the United States. Uh, we have programs that work on a variety of issues, including international development, economic growth, healthcare, and education. Uh, my program, the Open Technology Initiative, formulates policies to support open source innovations and open networks. We promote universal and affordable communications access through partnerships with communities, researchers, industry, and public interest groups. OTI believes in the potential of communications and media technologies to impact society writ large. And as recent events have demonstrated, social media has had a transformative impact on public diplomacy uh, and democratization. Beginning last January, all states were forced to grapple with the implications of social media, seeing either promise or peril, and as such, whether to harness the technology or attempt to suppress it. OTI would like to thank Alex for organizing uh, this great panel, and we are pleased to host such an expert panel to discuss this critical issue. So without further ado, uh, let me turn it over to Alex to get us started. You need to send the obligatory tweet to let everybody know that we're live. <laughs> Very important. So um, my name is Alex Howard. I work for O'Reilly Media. Um, I have the good fortune to get to cover the intersection of government, technology, and society. Um, it's hard to think of a uh, more you know, stunning intersection these days. Uh, have you seen how much change is sweeping the globe? Um, how much we are all connected in real time? Uh, how much we are experiencing events together? Uh, if, you know, you go right, not, right down the line, whether it's uh, the turmoil that's rolling in the Middle East, um, popular protests against bill he bills here in Washington, uh, upset consumers about decisions that um, organizations are making on their behalf, uh, concern about technology companies changing their terms of service, um, issues around privacy, issues around security, um, and of course things like the Super Bowl or the Grammys, which we all talk about in real time. We're all connected in ways that I think um, really only existed before in science fiction. Um, so let's get more connected right now. Uh, if you haven't tuned in, there is in fact a back channel here. It's, at, it's on Twitter. Uh, for all the fact that uh, more people are on Facebook than Twitter, Twitter is still where the real-time chatter is for any given event. That's no different here at Social Media Week. Um, there have been thousands of tweets. I expect there will be many more today. I encourage you to get on there. Uh, it's pound SMW Diplomacy if you're interested in tuning in to that particular channel. Um, if you're not familiar with the concept of hashtags, they're a lot like uh, channels on cable TV. You can tune into the conversation you want. Um, and I wanted to just start off with a quick uh, exercise to get us, you know, get a sense of what the room is like. Um, how many people here are on Twitter? Okay. How many people here are on Facebook? Okay. How many here are on Google Plus? All right. <laughs> Editorial comments later. <laughs> uh, how many people here have checked in on Foursquare so far? Okay. How many people here have watched a video on YouTube in the last day? Mm. All right. How many of you are on Pinterest? Wow. Okay. That's fast user adoption. Okay. So that, that sets a pretty good uh, grounding, right? We're, we're all um, on these platforms in one way or another. I think there's still some exceptions here. Um, if you're you know, not kind of seeing the difference between social media and past forms, the, the, I think the most important difference is the fact that it's reciprocal. Right? It's a two-way channel if you want it to be. People still can and do get on there to broadcast. State Department's no exception in that realm. But now there is media, nonprofits, other parts of government, general people. Right? So there's, there's, a, there's a dynamic that's different, but we want to explore sort of how that can be used for different ways. There is something that's important here, though in the sense that um, social media is not a new phenomenon in other senses, right? We've been communicating with each other for a long time. And uh, as I've gone through this week, and in fact, I've gone through the past couple years in DC at events like this, people spend a lot of time like this, right? So what I'd like you to do, just to loosen things up, is to turn to your right and introduce yourself, and then turn to your left and introduce yourself. Hi, guys. Hey, 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 nice socks. 
<laughs> Excellent. Dude, you just did a meetup. Yeah. Well done. Okay. Because I was, I was like, this fun? excuse, you know what I mean? Echo chamber, remember? Remember echo chamber? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Should have said in five minutes or two minutes. If I had a, a, a bell, I'd start ringing it now. Thank you for acting social. Social in a real sense, right? And then this is not to say that being on social media isn't real, quite real. And, and one of the questions we're going to get into is whether some of the interactions that happen in these platforms have offline actions. One of the most important questions I think that gets asked, why be here? Does it just change in, you know, people's conversations? What's the value of a retweet or a like, right? It really has to convert to something else. It doesn't matter what space it's in. But here, I'm really glad that you all got to meet each other because those are the kinds of weak ties that later on turn to something else. So with that, let's do a couple introductions. Um, sitting next to me, I have Ed Dunn. He is uh, at Ed and Dunn on Twitter, if you need to attribute him. Uh, he is the acting director of the US Department of State's Digital Communications Center. Sitting across from me, I have Nick Namba. He is Nicholas Namba, if you want to attribute him. He's the Acting Deputy Coordinator for Content Development and Partnerships at the U.S. Department of State's Bureau for International Information Programs. That's a mouthful, I know. Yeah, well you, you should, that's just one side of the card, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then we have uh, Suzanne Hall. He is, she is at S-U-Z-K-P-H on Twitter. Um, and she's the only one who's not acting here. You are the Senior Advisor the real of the uh, Innovation uh, in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural <laughs> Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Now, um, it wouldn't be government if they didn't show up with PowerPoint presentations. Um, I've asked uh, each of them to keep it under five minutes, and they will. Otherwise, they'll get cut off. Um, and they're going to um, rock out starting from here and then and head on in. So uh, three, three quick PowerPoints, and then we're going to get right to Q&A. So morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for the organizers for New America, for Alex. Um, I come from the Bureau of Public Affairs, so basically the spokesperson's office at the State Department. Talk a little bit about what we're doing on Twitter and then a few, or excuse me, on all social media properties and then a few examples. I, I'm aiming for four minutes, so go ahead and time me. Um, so my office, we run uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Tumblr. We have a blog called Dipnote. It's sort of the official mouthpiece from the spokesperson's office. So that's sort of how we couch it. We also run 10 foreign language Twitter feeds. Let's see if I can get them in alphabetical order right. Arabic, English, Farsi, French, Hindi, uh, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, Turkish, and Urdu. Um, we're trying to communicate mo mainly, mainly policy messaging uh, on sort of official US positions. Um, so that's sort of the arena that we're operating in. Um, we're trying to move from broadcast into more engagement. This is difficult, but also this is what I think people want. They want to engage the US government. They want to engage the State Department, both domestically and overseas, in English and in other languages, on policy issues that they care about. So we've been trying to create, craft a number of different initiatives to get at this a little bit better. One of the things we did in January was we held a series of Twitter briefings, where we had the department spokesperson, Toria Newland, Crowd, we basically crowdsourced questions from Twitter on all 11 of our language feeds, English plus the 10 foreign language feeds. And we allowed people to submit questions on anything they wanted. And then we took those questions every week, and she answered them from the podium in English. We then <coughs> took those, uh, those answers and we subtitled them in the source language, created YouTube videos and pushed them back out, and then tweeted them out to people who submitted the questions. It's just another way that we're trying to engage people more robustly, not just here in the States, but overseas, and do it in real time. Uh, another example of what we're doing is we have a program called Live at State. Live at State's built on the Adobe Connects platform. It essentially is shot in our studios in DC. It's, it gives journalists, specifically, overseas and around the world, an opportunity to engage with senior government officials in real time. Uh, on policy issues that they care about. We've done this uh, in English, we've done it in Spanish, we've also done it in Chinese, uh, live in real time with journalists overseas on issues ranging from uh, assistance in the Horn of Africa, education and cultural exchange with China, 
Uh, we've done, uh, we had the U.S. ambassador to Libya talking about the uh, salient issues there. We've done Arab Spring, anything like that. And it's, again, an effort to break down these barriers. It's all web-based. And then afterwards, we provide uh, video content, uh, the transcript and everything for journalists and bloggers. And they can embed it on their blogs. They can do whatever they want with it. This is an example of sort of what the page looks like in the interface. Um, another example is the secretary uh, did some, some robust outreach to Iranian audiences. We did two interviews, one with BBC Persian and one with Parazit, which is kind of an interesting show because it's very web-based. A lot of questions came in online. And then afterwards, we ended up shooting a lot of behind-the-scenes video, which tends to be very popular with the Iranian audience. Again, moving a little bit past having someone at the podium talking about formal policy issues and sort of getting into a little bit more engagement, trying to generate some conversation, but about sort of what is the US position on X issue. And then uh, here's a recent example uh, of engagement in Syria. Our ambassador, Robert Ford, uh, messages to the Syrian people and uh, images placed. This is from the Facebook page, the US Embassy Damascus Facebook page. So again, using these properties to try and get past uh, just broadcast and into more engagement and having robust conversations when we can't be there physically. I actually think social media is a wonderful way for us to um, have more conversations with more people across more spectrums when we physically can't be in a location because we can't be everywhere at once. And again, I also think the drive um, from our perspective is doing more and more in foreign languages because we can't just be communicating in English. We have to be doing it in the vernacular and, in, and on the platforms that people want to use and having conversations in the language in which they're comfortable. All right. Thank you. Five on the nose. Nice. All right, Rocky. Jeez. <laughs> Set the bar. Is, is, is it, it me? Standard? Or is it Suzanne? Is it me? Uh, please let's see. Let's see, see who's who comes up. up. I, think she, I think she's second. We're all driven by the PowerPoint yeah. at this point. We could just talk. All right, so uh, yeah, we could talk in a moment. But hey, go. my she's, turn. She's good. Hi, guys. <coughs> How are you doing? Um, my name is Suzanne Hall. Alex, thank you so much for, for making this happen. New America Foundation, thank you guys. Thank you guys for showing up at 9.30 on a Thursday, really. So psyched that this is a subject that you guys are interested in and, and willing to come out early for. Um, so I work in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, and I think what we were talking about before is between Ed and Nick and myself, you really have representatives of the three major pieces of the public diplomacy family at state. And I, you know, we're really interested to be able to kind of tell our story and, and connect with you guys today because we are working um, with different sort of top objectives. But there's a lot of ways that we are collaborating behind the scenes. And so we got you know, what I think is a, a great story to tell. From our perspective at Educational and Cultural Affairs, um, you know, what do we do? What's our headline? We do people-to-people -people exchanges. We do 50,000 a year, more or less. <laughs> Can I ask, how many of you guys have gone on an exchange, academic or otherwise, over the course of your lives? Did you, did you like it? Keep your hands up if you liked it. Do you remember it? Keep your hands up if you remember it. Awesome. So the point is, that is a great thing. Probably I don't even know how to use this. OK, let's go traditional toolkit. That's a great thing. We don't want to touch that. We see that that creates sort of mutual understanding that you just can't replace. Those are personal experiences. The, the question that I've got sort of is, how can we leverage um, you know, social media platforms and other uh, technologies to sort of scale and tail that experience? Really make it available to as many people who want to take part as possible. Um, so, you know, holding on to our core objective, connecting people in a person-to-person, first-person kind of way, but supplementing that and complementing that with virtual exchange um, opportunities. Another sort of core element that we do is English language programming, uh, very popular with both teachers and students abroad, as you can imagine. Um, educational USA advising. So, the whole deal on this is there's so many kids who want to come and study in the states. How do we help them navigate that process? I don't know about you guys, but for me, it was complicated enough. I mean, I barely remember it. I feel very old now. But you know, applying for college, applying for grad school, you know, it's OK, send in this fee, apply for this. Now, add on to that also taking an English language exam just to be able to get in. Not a straightforward process. So we do have a network of uh, more than 400 advisors around the world um, that we partner with to be able to help kids through that process. Um, and finally, alumni. This is a big one for us. So I mentioned you know, that person-to-person -person exchanges are our wheelhouse, right? 50,000 people a year that we are facilitating um, connections for. We have now um, a network of a million alumni around the world who have participated in some sort of State Department exchange. That's an awesome number. 
So we don't want to lose that power. There's so much networking capability. There's so much smarts there. We can be learning from them, hopefully providing them resources that might be helpful. How do we stay engaged with them? I'm going to walk you guys through. I bet I'll go over five. I talk so much. Um, so exchange to oh, just hitting the first sort of virtual exchange one. Again, scaling and tailing that virtual, uh, that physical experience. How can we make sure that this is more accessible to uh, youth, uh, specifically lower and middle income, who may not have, for example, um, the opportunity to apply or the cash to apply to, to participate in programs like this. Um, leveraging video conferencing platforms. Ed mentioned our use of Adobe Connects. Nick will be discussing that in more detail. Um, I've got Skype up here. You know, there's so many different ways that we could be making this happen. It's not for us a question of, hey, let's use the flashiest tool, right? Quite the opposite. A lot of the work that we do obviously happens in developing countries around the world. We need to be plugging in in a way um, that people can, can connect, that's useful for them, and where they live. In a place like Haiti, that's going to be more on a dumb phone, on a feature phone via mobile, right? Not on a high bandwidth um, you know, live video stream. And just a couple of examples. Again, uh, using uh, virtual exchange experiences to connect with wider audiences. Um, there's a lot of sort of uh, global events that take, part, that take place around the world that the State Department plays a role in. I've got a few up here, namely uh, the World Fair coming up this year in Yosu, in the very southern part of, of South Korea. How can we bring the themes of Yosu, focused on climate change, for example, um, to a wider audience? Otherwise, it's going to sort of not even impact an American audience or people in the region. Um, we want to get those conversations out. You've got incredible talent. Um, coming through there, let's engage in a broader way, and I think there's a lot of ways we can do that. All right, mobilizing English. I mentioned um, English language uh, you know, um, resources, both for teachers and students, are a huge piece of what we do um, from the public diplomacy standpoint through our embassies um, and consulates abroad. We're really pleased to say that we stood up the first mobile-based English language program in Tunisia in November of last year. This is a 90-day pilot um, in collaboration with our U.S. Embassy in Tunis and the largest mobile network operator in Tunisia called Tunisiana. Um, so I'm really psyched because I was trying to get you guys numbers so I would actually have some relevance today standing up in front of you. In a country of 10 million people, we have 535,000 unique users. Rock on. Like Usually State Department doesn't put up numbers like that. So we are very focused on the fact that you know, traditionally our measures, our metrics have been around did we um, actually work with you in a way that improved your English language skills? Reading, speaking, whatever it might be. In this short term, this was more about reach. In a country you know, uh, post-revolution where we had this opportunity, going forward, we're really going to be focused on those metrics that are kind of more on the traditional side. Did a mobile-based English language uh, program help you improve your English skills? I will say, and perhaps many of you are involved in this, but mobile education around the world is an emerging sphere. Um, so we're all still trying to get our, our arms around how it can be uh, a useful complement to a traditional sort of bricks and mortar classroom experience. Um, but you know, we're excited to learn more from this project. Um, Ed USA Digital Outreach. Um, so again, all these kids want to come study in the US. How can we help them? Well, we have this incredible physical network of 400 advising centers around the world that in no way meets the demand. Um, so our team um, has really developed a, a strong um, set of social media um, resources that can help sort of guide these kids at 3 in the morning when they finally got an extra minute and they can actually you know check things out. We're also developing some really impressive um, tools that will be available for um, um, you know um, low media environments where you can't really hook into that bandwidth. So thumb drives, CD-ROMs, etc. And alumni. Finally th those million people I was talking about. One of the things we're really focused on, um, anybody here go over on a State Department exchange ever? Hey, cool. So are you guys on alumni.state.gov? You know why? Because it's, it's, it's a really powerful place, right? But it's probably passwords that we don't remember. Um, and so what we're focused on now, well, that, that's a really impressive space that includes more than 80,000 of our alumni. That's not nothing. They've got incredible resources there, uh, webinars that are taking place, et cetera. We want to expand that circle. And one of the things I think we're, we're getting our arms around now is localizing that experience and making it really relevant for our alumni groups locally, in language, on the platforms that they use, whether Facebook, LinkedIn, just text, whatever it might be. So we're really looking to, look, to work with our local coordinators and um, you know, beyond the massive website that seeks to connect everybody, how can we kind of localize this networking and make it as impactful as possible for our alumni? Okay, last one. I'm sure I'm over. 
This is just for discussion later. You know, where can we take this to? Um, Nick and I were just talking about you know, really the spectrum of virtual exchange um, and you know, making it sort of more of an on-demand experience like I've got listed up here. You, know, um, you would like to connect with a counterpart in Japan and you're 18. Or we could make it more formalized. This teacher would like to connect their classroom with one in Ghana, right? There's a spectrum of engagement. Um, and we hope to be able to support uh, the efforts that are ongoing right now in the private sector and nonprofit space. Um, you know, I talked about this English language program we have in Tunisia. That's an incredible body of text-based information and hopefully audio at some point. Can we make that sort of uh, open, open resource? Can we make that a, a part of a, a public domain library that could be available for uh, related projects? Data visualizations. How do we better tell, more impactfully tell, the story of person-to-person -person exchanges, right? It's one thing for me to sit up here and say, yo, we do 50,000 a year. That's a big number. We've got a million people around the world. Tell me the story. Make it real. You know, I mean, Alex just had you guys meet each, you know, meet each other, turn around. It's that quick video with an alumni of how it changed the, the life, let's say, of a, of a woman from Pakistan. So just some sort of you know, ideas I'm, I'm going forward. Um, that's how you can reach me. And I do want to give a shout out because my son's here. He's four and a half. And I'm really hopeful that he's the youngest participant in Social Media Week February 2012. Not that he's in the room, but <laughs> he's virtualizing his experience by watching cars. Thank you, guys. <laughs> nice. Thank you. All right, well, we're waiting for this to come up. Um, thanks to everyone. I'm not going to get into it. They said thanks. They're gonna eat, that's going to eat into my five minutes, I think, everyone I need to thank. But I think we all, we all got it. Um, so we've got Ed, who comes from Public Affairs. That's the policy. That's the secretary. That's the president. Everyone knows you've got to go to Public Affairs if you want the official word on what our policy is. You've got my friend over here, Suzanne, who's educational, exchanges, English language, study in the United States, come to the United States, long-term, really impactful, probably the most impactful thing the U United States government does in terms of our engagement overseas. If you go on an exchange program, there's no better way to learn about America and to think positively about America. So what do you do in between that? So you don't want to listen, you don't want to hear the secretary talk for 30 minutes, and you don't want to go on an exchange where you can't afford it and you can't afford English language training. You come to IIP. This is the place where we have sustained conversations on a daily basis. It's our job to talk to almost everyone in the world every single day. Um, social media is the new fancy toy. Uh, everyone's loving it. It's growing really fast. It probably will be our main platform. Uh, but we do have bread and butter products that, that are working today and are incredibly impactful. So just to give you a little bit of background, IIP operates 800 American spaces all over the world. Um, these are spaces that are owned, operated, or partnered with local institutions to offer an American experience to, to local people on the ground, walk up, engage, learn about the United States, meet with someone. Um, just, to give you an, just to give you some kind of uh, you know, context for that, that's more international stores than Apple, Gap, and Target combined. So we, that's the US government storefront, if you will. Um, we create the publications that everyone reads about America over, overseas. Um, books, publications, magazines, journals, tweets, Facebook postings. They reach about 50 million people every year. Um, these are all foreigners, by the way. We conduct about 1,000 virtual events every single year and about 5,400 in-person events. Uh, and that's connecting Americans to locals on the ground across every spectrum of United States culture, government, business, entrepreneurship, you name it, we do it. And then on the technical side, we run every single website for the, United, for the US Department of State. So every embassy site, every consulate site, all of our virtual posts, that's 450 websites, 55 languages, 300,000 people a day. Um, so that's the stuff that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's the social media stuff that's grabbing everyone's attention. Um, so what are we doing on that front? Oh, by the way, building America's reputation overseas, I'm kind of trying that out. Let me know what you think. Um, uh, we're trying, you know, <laughs> uh, I want to talk about um, Race to Four Million. So we just completed that. This was a social media campaign where we wanted to raise the department's social media fan base, followers, et cetera, to four million people. We did it over a three-month period of time. Um, we focused on really engaging tar uh, content, mar market-specific strategies. We went to every single country that has a Facebook presence and we figured out what they wanted to read about America, hear about America, study about America, tailored content to their needs. Uh, we ran promotions. We worked with our embassies. We worked with the private sector to do it. And in just over three months, we did. We got to 4 million. So we went from 800,000 to about 4 million. Why did we do that? Frankly, 
we felt that we needed some kind of statistically meaningful engagement with the world. We were kind of ho-humming around at under a million, and we're like, we got we to gotta build this up. We got to see if it makes sense. So we raced to four million. It was fantastic. Um, the results are we got 125 million views, 350,000 engagements. Uh, top countries that, that, that overtly wanted to engage with us, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, Egypt, Bangladesh, Nepal. Um, our engagement rates were on par with White House and Coca-Cola. So we did something right. We learned quite a bit. And that's one of the reasons why we did it, because we needed to know what the hell we were going to do on social media. We didn't really know. We needed to try it out. We needed to gain some expertise in it. And so what's next? We launched it this week, Social Media Week, 2100 Social Media Challenge. Uh, this is taking what we learned from the race to 4 million and moving it out to 20 of our embassies. So we are deploying teams. I'm, I come from the private sector, so I'm going to say we're deploying consulting teams to 20 embassies, and we're going to double their social media presence uh, over the next year. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take what we learned from the race to 4 million, devise really specific content, uh, help them target their, their message, understand their audience, figure out what their audiences are talking about, and then really go after them. Um, it is going to be a, a fantastic initiative for those embassies, and it's growing their local Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Youku, Weibo, whatever it is, because we don't care. We don't necessarily focus on Facebook until we focus on whatever is indigenous in the country. So Orkut, you name it, we'll, we're going to help them do it. And we're really excited about it, and our posts are really excited about it, because it's an expertise that, frankly, our diplomats are gaining, but not everyone has it. So we're going to deploy teams to help them out. And then our future, um, which we are working on right now, and it will be more uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. And actually, I'm going to have a shout out to our director of audience research and analysis, who is in the audience. So if you have questions about that. But this is, so you understand social media. You know you want to go out there. But it still doesn't tell you what your people, what your audience overseas wants to hear. What are they thinking? So what are we trying to do? We want to give our officers in the field, our ambassadors, our public affairs officers, our economic officers, an idea about what their publics are thinking on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. So they can come in, if you will. This is sort of our pie in the sky goal is someone will walk in, they'll get a report out, and they'll be like, these are the issues that people are talking about now. Here are the trends that are happening over the past day, 48 hours, week, month. Because for too long, our officers have been, based on a lot of education, based on a lot of, frankly, cultural awareness, in a way, shooting in the dark. With social media, you don't have to do that. A lot of the data about what people are thinking, feeling, saying is on social media, but you got to suck it all in, analyze it, and then present it in a way that our people can take really quick actions with. And so this is next for us. That's it. Shortest. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, this is uh, great evidence of the fact that the State Department is quite eloquent in talking. So <laughs> now we get to talk a little bit about how good you are at listening. Uh, let's uh, pull this together a little bit, if you don't mind, so we don't have to stare across the gulf. We've got a live stream right there, so let's see how this goes. Now, I, uh, I used the interwebs to get questions <coughs> ahead of time. We have uh, 54 votes and 14 questions from 14 people. Uh, they're not a perfectly representative sample. They're the people who are following me or New America, but um, there are some good questions that came through. And if you have questions that you want to see asked that you don't think I'm asking, I um, want to hear from people here in the room, too. Um, it is my practice during these forums, I will say, um, to take questions over Twitter, because I find that that means they stay short. And they uh, continue to be a question, not a statement. Um, and uh, because a lot of the time I'm moderating discussions with government, that's desirable. Mm. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> that being said, uh, uh, this question of listening is not a minor one uh, these days, especially in these platforms. Uh, someone who covers this, uh, you, we see news break there first all the time. Uh, Twitter has been letting us know uh, when uh, Whitney Houston's death uh, broke that actually news of it was on Twitter an hour before the mainstream media picked it up. You know, that someone had shared it out, that it was starting to expand within a certain conversation around people who knew. Um, given uh, how fast change is sweeping certain parts of the globe, 
uh, you know, certainly in the Middle East, uh, certainly um, when uh, there's an event like the tsunami in Japan, we see the news break there first. Uh, famously, this happened in Haiti, too. Um, to what extent is the State Department listening to these conversations and then bringing that back to um, actionable intelligence, from open source intelligence, that then policymakers who need it, literally at their fingertips, can use it? And how? I mean, before we even answer, that was so over 140 characters, Alex. Oh, I'm allowed to ask long questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, he I, didn't I, tweet it. Then. Well, not so much. <laughs> Um, do you want me to take that? Yeah, no what, I, what I can tell you is, is that you're absolutely right. Listening is key, but we don't have the capacity. I mean, unlike anything else, our diplomats have been really good at having one-on-one -on -one or one to very small group conversations historically. But with so much of the conversation moving online now, we have no, but we don't have the staff, we don't have the resources to listen to it all. But you know, if we look at what's happening in the Middle East, it's really important to listen to what's happening, uh, listening what, everyone is talking about. So in terms of initiatives, we have, and this is not just PA, ECA, or IIP, this is a broader Department of State, um, broader um, national policy uh, issue, and that is to figure out a way where we can, on an enterprise-wide level, bring down the data, analyze it, and then make it actionable for the field and for the secretary and for all of her principals. Um, it's really nascent. I can tell you everyone's trying to do it. Uh, and no one has, a really, has really figured it out. Um, it's costly. It's a boatload of data. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we have a numerous pilots underway to try and figure it out before we make the hardcore investment. But I can say that we are piloting a process to suck down large amounts of social media data and then provide that information to our posts and to uh, department principals. So you're not just following Andy Carbon? We do that too. We, okay. Part of it. <laughs> <laughs> if I could, I would say, yeah, please. you know, given, I mean, that's sort of where we're going. What we're doing now, I mean, there are a number of free open source tools that we can utilize that scrape this data at various levels. I would say it goes deeper than sort of the first tracking hashtag level to get at where are these conversations happening? Is it not just happening in English? There are some free tools available that we're using, and especially in the event of a crisis, like you said, in Japan, the Haiti earthquake, I would say um, now it's, it's basically par for the course when there's a task force that stood up, there's a social media component of that to make sure we're, given the tools that we have available, we're doing our best to listen to these conversations and not miss something. Because as you said, the stuff breaks very quickly and Twitter is an excellent example of that. So we're definitely moving in that direction and we're using, I would say, some stopgap tools that we have right now at our fingertips, given the absence of more sophisticated enterprise-wide deep dive analytics. Well, uh, the, I mean, we're, we are living in the age of big data, right? It's the exabyte age at this point. So the, the tools that we've typically had for uh, analysis of these you know, gigantic data sets uh, simply aren't up to it. And um, you know, I could put in a free plug for O'Reilly's big data conference at this point, Strata Conference, because this is what we're interested in. And what, what's uh, notable, in fact, is the dynamic you mentioned, that um, open source tools are actually lending um, the power that people need to get through this amount of, uh, of, of information and make sense of it. Um, can you share what, what uh, states are trying to use in this space? I mean, my office, we're using, um, We've, been, we've used ThinkUp, we've used, uh, you know, sort of the free stuff in Hootsuite. We've also, we used TweetReach um, immediately after uh, some engagements that we, we have to sort of see what the bounce is, who's having these conversations, and, uh, you know, Google Analytics, a couple other, um, uh, uh, what is it, TweetMap, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Okay. To, to sort of get different snapshots and aggregate it and then move forward. It is by no means a comprehensive, you know, uh, deep dive look, but it gives us a good snapshot uh, uh, of information that we're, that we're tracking. Okay. You know, Alex, if I could mention, I mean, you, you shouted out Andy Carvin, who obviously has become this global voice specifically around <coughs> events in the, in the Middle East and North Africa over the last year. Um, it's true, too, that stories break locally. And one of the things I think we're encouraging our post to do is really like you said, it's, it's how do you listen and how do you listen locally? So we can draw our kind of global nodes map with you know, those big voices on Twitter who are talking about um, the subjects that internationally folks are paying attention to. But then who are the voices who are going to talk about a landslide in Colombia? Right? And there are those local voices. And so one of the things we're working with our posts around, our embassies, is to say, you know, start identifying 
um, who those folks are, how they, how they interact, interact with them directly. Um, so I think this is both sort of, it's got a global, some global elements that we from here in Washington can, can start to tackle. Um, but it's also an exercise that needs to be done on an embassy basis. That's one point. Second point quickly is just to say we are totally aware that we're not going to be able to get this right by ourselves. And to that extent, um, many of you might have attended the last Tech at State we had on real-time awareness, where you're, you're you know, trying to jump into that issue. What efforts are happening in the private sector and the nonprofit space to help us kind of filter and more accurately drink from the fire hose, right? Um, and so this, is, this has got to be a group effort. These are big questions that uh, many of us, State Department and far beyond, are trying to tackle. Okay. I think one additional point is we can't discount the human factor, both in Washington and in, in, in the field. Is it's been a pivot for, the, for our diplomats here and, and in the field to start listening, mm -hmm. with or without the technology. And that is an important movement to yeah. take place because for many years we have been in the dissemination mode and now we are sitting back and we have people assigned just to take it in and then move it amongst ourselves. And I think that is an important step for us to take regardless of whatever technology makes it easier. So state is actually trying to move towards being a listening organization but some time here to figure that out. Well, we need to make it easier on ourselves, that, no doubt about it. I mean, it's, okay. you know, uh, it's the world. We're tasked with mon monitoring the world. Um, and you know, as we all know, far fewer diplomats than military personnel, for yes. instance. For instance. Um, so there's a, uh, if you're talking about the military, they're quite protective of their tactics, understandably. Uh, people in diplomacy are uh, quite protective of their sources and methods. Uh, in public diplomacy, though, it's somewhat interesting because, of course, you're all out there. Uh, but there are many cases in countries where if you're listening to people, if you're listening to the right person at the right time, um, you have to be careful about, uh, how to say, uh, making that action public. Hmm. All right? um, and if you see the, the people who are often at great risk to themselves uh, tweeting or sharing information <coughs> from these spaces, um, they are taking risks. So if you're, if you're actively listening, that can pose challenges. Um, how are you, as you move into this process, making sure that the people who you want to protect on the ground are not damaged by that listening? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll take a stab. Um, all of us right now, I mean, you're looking at three Foreign Service officers. We've all served abroad in a, in a number of different places. We're all right now back here in Washington. Honestly, we're not the right people to be asking that. Those are locally developed sources. Um, those are networks that um, you know, we are not managing, thank God, from here in DC. We're not the best place to manage it. And those are decisions that need to be taken locally, both informed, again, the listening effort, right? Um, if you're developing that one-on-one that -on -one relationship um, with a person who has uh, privacy considerations, security considerations, whatever it might be, it's that person who's got to define the terms. And that's just a very localized process, you know? I think there's best practices. I think that you can say, you know, um, it's, a, it's a female in a certain country where that person's with a high profile would be in a lot of danger, um, and you can carry those with you. One part that, again, is, is in terms of, um, you know, the, the weight and history and experience that we bring, we have to be careful to not just simply implant that somewhere else. I mean, it really can't be a cookie cutter approach. I think one advantage, too, of us having essentially one, you know, we're a large multinational organization. We've got field offices in almost every single country in the world. So the key, I think, to, to that protection question is you listen. And frankly, listening is part of the reward. We need, to, we need to make sure that they understand they're being heard. But what's great is we take it offline. We've got people deployed, so we don't have to go back in cyberspace. We don't have to worry about someone hacking. We've got folks on the ground that can take that conversation offline or through another mechanism, which I think is, is not necessarily what you have when you have a, a to one person in the US trying to communicate with someone in Syria. Well, no, no, we've actually got folks there. Uh, and that helps us out, I think, quite a bit from protecting our sources. And also, the State Department has a long history of being very careful about that, and I think people have learned to trust us. So uh, in an example of real-time listening, I see some people in the crowd are getting uh, angsty about wanting uh, outcomes. And in fact, the number one voted question on moderator was what offline outcomes have resulted from social media and digital diplomacy? Mm -hmm. So let's go down the way here. One outcome, real action, real difference that was made from using <coughs> these tools, starting here, coming on down. Um, you know, I get to reach beyond, okay, Tunisia Mobile English. Um, our uh, 
our access programs, these are micro-scholarship English language programs um, that are great, that are reaching hundreds of kids, but they're <coughs> reaching kids in the capital of Tunis, in Sfax, and uh, a couple of additional cities. Our embassy is in the process of, of sharing that out. Uh, but how do I reach uh, youth in particular in Tunisia, in the south and the central um, places? Uh, we are working right now with the carrier to get um, sort of a deep dive in terms of that demographic information. Um, but the anecdotal information around it through um, informal focus groups has been that we have reached beyond those traditional places um, where we offer those, again, bricks and mortar educational experiences. So I'm proud that, you know, while looking at a small cell phone is not in any way going to make you fluent in English, that is a touch that we've made beyond, you know, the urban centers uh, where we normally have a presence. I'm going to give you two examples, both from Vietnam, because we have a fantastic team in Vietnam who are really reaching out to their folks via social media platforms. One small, one a little bit larger, but they're indicative of, 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 of programs that are going on er everywhere in the world. And that is, um, and this is a, s a simple action, but has, has garnered quite a bit of um, goodwill in Vietnam. And that is uh, our American spaces, which we have there. These are libraries, these are places for people to learn about America. They've decided to turn what they put in that American space, from the library, from the books, to the DVDs, to the posters, to the speakers they bring in, and they crowdsource everything. So they make sure, they, they ask their audience via social media what they want to hear. And so what has that done? Completely reinvigorated the place. You, it's standing room only for all of their events. Um, and they've, I think they've doubled the amount of people that are visiting that space. Um, in any given time frame, which is fantastic. The more people we see, the more people uh, we can in inform, inform and influence. And then let me take it up a little bit notch. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll focus to our Ambassador Shear in Vietnam. Uh, he wanted, he's one, not your typical ambassador because he was assigned to go to Vietnam. He's like, I want to talk to young kids in Vietnam. And he came to us and, we, and he said, how do I do that? And we said, well, why don't we introduce you? Why don't we figure out a way so you can not be um, on camera talking about policy, but why don't you tell people about yourself? And so we did a very short two-minute video of him talking about his life, his family, what he wants to achieve, social media friendly. We worked with The Post uh, to distribute it via social media, via broadcast television, uh, print, news, you name it. In the end, three quarters of the Vietnamese population saw it. Before he even arrived on the ground, he had young kids wanting to engage with him on Inter you know, policy issues that affected Vietnam, U.S. relations. Never happened before. And he credits, you know, that social media activity as opening up an entirely new door to him to figure out what a large segment of the Vietnamese population are thinking so and the doing. offline outcome is that people are interested in meeting with him. And right, right. And the key is, is w and you'll hear this from me so several times, that social media is one venue. You've got to link it to traditional media and other offline activities for it to really be successful in, in, in the way that we want it to be. Okay. Our mission in Brazil uh, initiated an effort to get out to the 50 largest cities in the country, a massive country, very large population. So they worked to identify people who were young, civic activists, <coughs> you know, journalist types who were very active online. And then when they would go out and visit in small teams to these 50 cities, they would then uh, make an effort to meet these people in person. And that online-offline interplay, which then continues when they go back to uh, one of the cities in the country where we have a formal diplomatic presence, that conversation continues. And then the next time we go out and visit, we are able to meet with those people, with, with people that they're in touch with, people they think are important, young rising leaders in country. So using digital tools to reach out and identify um, people that we want to have a deeper conversation with and then um, blowing that out, you know, expanding that sort of outreach is a good example of how digital tools can take it going from online to offline and then back and forth to sort of expand people that we're talking to and making sure we're getting a multiplicity of views and, and meeting different people in different geographic regions in a big country like Brazil. So one of the most overused uh, words currently, I think, in government, whether it's social media, data, uh, crowdsourcing, is, is innovation, right? It's, it's become buzzworded into the ground. It's unfortunate <laughs> because government desperately needs it, country desperately needs it, and probably the world needs it. Um, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the simple way to kind of describe it tends to be um, doing more with less, right? Using uh, the available resources you have to do something in a way that you weren't able to previously get into a better outcome. 
Um, the, the challenge the government has with it um, is a, a often quite full of risk averse institutions um, is that there's not a lot of tolerance for failure mm. and that uh, cultures do not reward that, <laughs> right? Well, so the question is, um, what's an example of a place where uh, using social media in the context of public diplomacy has failed and what did you learn from it? Fail fair, PD 2.0. Going through and head. Um, so we are the government. It's hard for us to answer that question, Alex. Uh -huh. um, but I, I have to ask it. It's very important. Do. Yeah. Um, guys? <laughs> <laughs> While you're thinking, yeah. uh, <laughs> go, go ahead. I would say that, and this is sort of a, a general comment on <laughs> deploying these technologies. You know, at times there's a rush to be in the virtual space. Like we need to be there. We recognize how important it is. And with certain audiences and certain populations, some of these tools are just not appropriate. Um, they, that's not where people are, are having these conversations. It's not, not where they're using them. You know, um, certain platforms are not available in certain countries around the world. So it's not really useful to be plugging away uh, on some of these platforms if, if populations that we want to have conversations with can't access them. Mm -hmm. I would say just generally, and that, the, that happen, has happened in, in a number of cases in a number of countries. You ready for us all to speak in generalities? I got one. So, I, I expected it. Yeah. You know. um, the government contracting process is a lengthy and clunky one, and there are great reasons behind that, and that's to protect American tax dollars. As we think about um, creating um, digital spaces often um, that are the most engaging for youth or otherwise, those are sometimes big investments we've got to make. And the amount of time that it would take for us to, number one, make that policy decision to go ahead and invest in something, um, do um, an open competitive bid to identify the right firm to develop said effort, um, and then you know, modify um, and sort of iterate on that project while it's in development, what seemed like a fabulous and, and groundbreaking idea, you know, three to five years ago is now, you know, not irrelevant, but perhaps needed to be morphed in a big way. So I think our challenge, you know, a lot of it comes in sort of institutionally how we work. Um, the government contracting process is not going to change anytime soon. How do we balance the need to um, have that flexibility and that agility? Um, as people change what platforms you guys are operating on, where you live, let alone here in the United States abroad, right? Um, so, you know, kind of trying to balance how the government contracting and investment process meets with the space of technology. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I will say, too, is, is to, the, to the premise of your question, and that is, is you know, f is failure acceptable? What I will say is, is, is that the highest level of acceptance that I've ever seen in the Department of yeah. State? That's a good point. Um, and it has changed dramatically since we all entered the Foreign Service mm -hmm. when you needed to you know, have the public affairs officer or even Washington authorize any tweet or any Facebook posting. That has gone a long way where now we have officers all over the world tweeting and, and, and posting on their own. Um, also, I think that in pub the public diplomacy world, we, have, we were blessed by private sector leadership who understands uh, that to succeed, you have to fail. Um, and I think that our previous undersecretary uh, was, was accepting of that, not that she would have taken a bad ratio of failure to in, you know, innovation. Um, and then I guess uh, to more directly answer your question is, is any time our officers or folks in Washington have thought that social media was the singular answer to any problem, it has failed because it is not. Uh, and I think that we have proven that over and over and over again. And people, particularly early on a couple years ago, thought it was the panacea. And what we have proven is that it's not. Particularly in public diplomacy, when you're trying to move the needle, inform, change perspectives, inspire action, social media is one component of our overall uh, engagement. So let me make this a little bit more concrete. Um, what happened with the virtual embassy in uh, Iran? Any lessons learned there? Nothing that didn't surprise, nothing that surprised us, do you know what I mean? I mean, we were geared up <coughs> for the, the hackathon that would become the onslaught against that website well before it went live. And you guys can comment on this as well. Um, we were, um, you know, the, the team, our colleagues on the Iran desk and, and all those who were supporting them in, in Nick's shop and beyond, 
were quite aware of, you know, the, again, offensive that would come with them when they launched. That was a very public announcement. And for those of you who don't know, it was uh, end of December? Um, that the uh, virtual U.S. Embassy to Tehran to, in, to Iran was launched, um, and almost immediately, you know, it was it was not accessible in country um, because uh, the government blocked it basically, and so that was a site that um, had a lot of high-profile um, sort of voices around it. The secretary herself had uh, noted that it was going to be launched. Um, a lot of us worked on on developing content that would be most useful for Iranian citizens that we hoped would engage there. Um, that to say, Alex, you know, we are going to continue with that effort. We think it's, the, it's the, the only foot that we can put forward right now in Iran is a digital one, right, in a sense. And so um, to that end, uh, we want to continue to support this thing, and, and we'll do it in spite of this offensive. Right. Well, I figure if there are feet in the ground, it's probably not the State Department's. <laughs> are we here to talk PDA or not? Uh, that's a different department. So, uh, Dude, can I just add one more thing yep. to, the, yeah. to the fail fair? And you guys can talk around. I'm going back to like the fail fair, and this has nothing to do with technology. I think again, the theme here. And you guys, when we talk about public diplomacy, let's just take it a step back. Here's diplomacy, right? That's <coughs> governments talking to governments. Public diplomacy is governments talking to people, or people. We're we're people too, right? Like we're diplomats, but we're people too, talking to people. Um, and I think the fail comes digitally or otherwise when it's a monologue, when it's not that, got that listening part, right? And so that can then, you know, um, manifest itself in any different, in, in a variety of different ways that show that lack of listening. Whether it's something as simple as a public diplomacy officer in the field who didn't really gauge what music would have been the most appropriate to really like spark a conversation with youth. And instead of bringing in the hip hop group, you're bringing in like the Appalachian cloggers, wicked sorry if anybody's from Appalachia. But just to say like, there's a way to listen and to figure out what part of American culture or our, um, you know, who we are would best connect with those people. Again, digitally or otherwise, that is an exercise in listening. Like you couldn't have nailed it harder. Okay, so we'll go back to the uh, the voted upon questions here, so to not get more restiveness from the audience. Um, is it possible? See, we are, we already got into a little bit of, of this second question. Is it possible to use social media platforms as data resources to evaluate or assess public diplomacy projects? How can we make better use of the data? Great question. Anybody? Yeah, I would say, um, I would unpack that a little bit differently. Social media is a great way to amplify on uh, offline you know, public diplomacy programs, like performing groups is a good example. You can shoot video, you can share it, you can stream it on Facebook, you can use this to increase sort of the bang for your buck. And I think uh, it's a good indication of how popular something could be if you try and expand the audience out uh, in a digital way and it doesn't really pop. Uh, I think that's, and, and you can quantify that. You know, you can also quantify how many people were in a given auditorium to listen to a performing group, but when you, when you take it digitally, you have much more data to mine and you have, I, I think, more anecdotal evidence, you know, commentary, uh, whether it runs in media, things like that. So I think they're useful tools if, if you deploy the content properly. Uh, to give you another way to evaluate the efficacy of what we're trying to do. Now, the uh, famous adage in management, you can't uh, manage what you can't measure, right? And one of the, the challenges in, in government we're seeing right now is this precise issue. How do you um, see what the performance of a given program is, especially if you're spending X amount of dollars against it? So that goes to the earlier question about um, do these programs, do these efforts have offline action or not, yeah. right? Is there something that comes with them? Um, when you're looking at this specific issue around data, um, how close are you to uh, establishing metrics for outcomes and then putting them against um, how much is being spent against that? So actually see the efficacy of American taxpayer dollars against these actions. Is that something, you, you, do you have the data for that? Are you putting it up in some way you can see internally? Is that something you'll be able to dump quietly to the Senate intelligence community if, when, when they ask for it on their iPad? You want to put your R hat back? I mean, I guess from a, you take that away. I, I think that uh, this is a question that many people have been asking us. And, and as we, in particular, move into difficult budget times, we have to justify our existence. I mean, that, that I don't think that uh, we can do what we do without doing it. With that said, it's incredibly challenging, as you all know, um, to, to figure out what public diplomacy projects, programs worked, what didn't work, to what degree did they work or didn't work. Um, we're working on it every single day.
because we know it's incredibly important for us to figure it out. We have made progress over the past couple years at coming out with some broad brush stroke um, measurement and evaluation of what we're doing in the field. Um, and I'm going to point out our director of evaluation and uh, research and evaluation. She's here. If you have off specific questions, she can answer a lot of that because um, she is charged with making sure we do that. But guess what? And I'll tell you what, it's important because, you know, I think Dean has been in her job for less than a year, but we established an office just to do solely that. Link, money, dollars, re, uh, impact together and to put it forward for, for wider consumption. Um, we don't have the great solution. I'll tell you what, it's really expensive. Um, and I think social media can play a role, but it's not the only role. Uh, so we're trying to work out how we exactly do it. We, we have data, some broad level data. We know it needs to get a lot better, frankly. And um, there's that big R department perspective. I will tell you, our posts are doing a much better job at it locally yeah. on their own. They're actually thinking about, OK, was it impactful? What, what was the impact? Um, and they're asking their people via social media, in person, through surveys, um, whatever mechanism makes sense, mobile, SMSing. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of our embassies do what makes sense in their area. And then they're, in turn, moving it up to us. So uh, heading on down the, uh, the line here, um, have US diplomats been using social media effectively in the Arab Spring or post-Arab Spring period? I guess we can call that the Arab winter now. And uh, if so, what are some examples? I would say one of the prime <coughs> examples just in the past couple weeks is Ambassador Ford's use of the Embassy Damascus Facebook page mm. to communicate, and it's not just the past couple weeks, the past couple months, to communicate directly uh, with the Syrian people. You know, I got to shout out as well Ambassador Rice at the at the UN. Um, she's been a very strong voice at the, uh, you know, at the sort of diplomatic pointy end of the spear on this one. Um, so um, perhaps not, you know, she's not there sitting there in the region, but she's been incredibly vocal on Twitter, um, uh, you know, real-time kind of updates on the negotiations behind the scenes. Um, for example, most recently, our strong standpoints um, around the resolution that we tried to get through um, that ultimately did not pass. Uh, but so I would say that not only are you seeing um, an effective use of social media by our missions in the region, but you're also seeing the multiplicity of voices that are by definition working on this very complicated, very broad topic. Um, from a number of different points. And you know, that's not, I mean, let's talk resources too. It's not perfect. Let's go back to the fail fair. Um, these people are under an enormous amount of pressure, our colleagues in these embassies, um, as we go through these revolutions. Um, and, and part of our discussion, um, it, and it's a very real one, is in a time of revolution when you know, you're having evacuations from embassies and this sort of thing, what priority is placed on continuing to post on your Facebook page, right? And to be honest with you, these were qu questions that uh, first kind of came to the fore when we really were around the Haiti quake, uh, now a couple of years ago. But um, what we found was this is an incredibly important place for, for example, American citizens who live overseas to receive information um, regarding their status in those countries. Um, so I think in the disaster response and in the political upheaval space, we've made those arguments. We see the value in it. The challenge still comes in a, in a time of limited resources and really a lot of high pressure, who's going to be tweeting, right? It's just a very real question. Um, some posts have it figured out better than others. Um, oftentimes, that's our leadership. That's who the ambassador is and, and what kind of premium they put on those spaces. Um, but it's, something, it's, it's, a, it's a, a gray space that we're still trying to sort out. If I could just jump in again, I think also, you know, during the recent uh, you know, <coughs> situation up in New York, Secretary Clinton was up there, Ambassador Rice was up there, we were also amplifying those messages um, basically in real time in, in Arabic, Farsi, and, other la and French, you know, languages spoken in the region to, I mean, in a broadcast mode, but just to get our message out there using social media saying, this is what we're saying in New York in real time. So uh, if the follow-up question uh, comes from Rob, and it's, I guess, to this, this point, so that, yeah, it's gets more into it. Um, what are the best examples of how diplomats are transcending social media as a broadcast platform uh, to true sustainable community engagement? You know, when, when we talk about uh, social media in the context of media, right? I think social is going to drop out of media pretty soon. Mm -hmm. It's going to be integrated Yay. into what we do. Yes. Um, but it's Social Media Week, so we're going to talk about it. Um, the uh, the difference, I think, in, in engagement is whether you're willing and able, able part's important, um, to amplify the voices of your community. 
right? To raise up the people who are, are disempowered, to get those voices who are crying out for help or for attention or uh, that, that need to have their message heard by a much broader platform um, into a broader space. Yeah. That, that's probably the secret sauce of what Andy Carvin <coughs> does. It comes down to it. Right. You know, finds people who are actually there, finds crisis data, and that has some kind of documentary side to it. Either someone he authenticates is there and uses their text, mm -hmm. or a picture or a video. Um, to what extent can the State Department do that on your, on your platforms? You know, and again, getting back to the issue of risk to them, but if something's out there in these public networks, um, can you raise that up and in, in, in to share what's happening there with a much you know, broader audience? Because obviously, there are a lot of people listening to you. Okay, offer a start. You guys might have different perspectives. I think one of the biggest challenges, again, this goes back to the listening thing. There's a couple of themes that are emerging <laughs> here, right? Um, one of the toughest things for a government to do, what's our job, is to have a unified message in part, right? Uh, we're not a company. We, words are our currency to a certain degree. And so making sure that we all kind of step forward together. So what's the scariest thing you could propose to a government? that someone else would be taking that word, that someone else would be sharing a message that would feel like it was being supported by you. So just that as a frame. One space, and, and Alex, this isn't an all the way answer to your question, but um, it's given the reins to your Facebook page to a youth who participated in an exchange in country. Hey, dude, come blog for us. Come post something up. Share your photos. That's going to be something that the youth in this case, a Brazilian kid, let's say, would have to agree to do. Um, but I think one space where we're doing this pretty well is um, a Ning site that we manage in um, educational and cultural affairs where we do just that. This is something that we acted as a catalyst to kind of set up, right? It's a Ning site that we manage, yes, and, and my colleagues back in ECI and the web team are, are doing this day in and day out. But the idea is to not have our voice dominate and not to have our information dominate. It's to let people who have participated in exchanges of all ages from all around the world share information around specific themes, around, you know, hey, what's coming up? Just socializing around certain things. But again, it's, it's that taking the scary out of it, right? And showing that indeed these people have incredible views to share and, and it's in our best interest to be listening. I, I think that, uh, one, we're doing it. Um, it. It's a great question. And using our platforms to amplify another voice is important. Uh, I can give you some examples. Uh, our, we have a, a climate change focused Facebook page, we regularly invite people to guest blog, to use our platform in their words. Um, and, and it's incredibly successful. Uh, and it's probably one of our fastest growing assets um, that, that we have. And I think in part because of that, um, it's legitimate. Um, and, then and then what I'll do is, also in, again, a theme, the offline version. Mm -hmm. So we also use our American spaces as platforms as well. and so. We don't expect people just to come to our programs. We literally say, here's a room that's fully connected, totally. that's air conditioned. You use it the way you want to use it. You set up an event. And it's been particularly successful in India, where uh, yeah, India is going through the roof in terms of development. But guess what? More than half of the population never have access to this kind of, like, you know, a, an air conditioned room, for instance, or the internet. Um, so we let them use our multi-story American Center in New Delhi to bring and to talk about whatever they want, set up their community group, um, use the space for, for what it is. So I've got a question here <coughs> from uh, Matt Armstrong, a mountain runner. Matt, uh, Matt. yeah. Hey so uh, th this is going to get a little bit wonky, but um, <laughs> I, I had the opportunity to look at the RSVP list of you all. You're all pretty wonky. Uh, so uh, here we go. Uh, he's now, now, Matt Good is the point. former executive director of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy, and he blogs at mountainrunner.us. So uh, we can probably assume he's thought about this a bit. Um, oh. So questions from Matt. There are three organizations represented about on the panel. Two are in public diplomacy, and one is not. Um, how do they coordinate and deconflict messages? One. Two, and this is very interesting. The law says IAP messages are not allowed in the U.S., Public affairs messages are. The law says Nicholas Namba can't share message details. <laughs> Thoughts. <laughs> OK. Um, Matt, so you're awesome. um, Spot why on. should IAP not be in public affairs, or why should public affairs social media not be in IAP? So this is an interesting question, right? In a world where um, tweets, Facebook posts are accessible everywhere, how do old regulations or laws apply to this? So 
to you. Start? You want me to start? Uh, you know, one, what I, what I would say is, is Matt's first question that two of us are in public diplomacy and, and one of us is not. I would actually reject that. I would too. Um, uh, because I think that we're all in public diplomacy. Yeah. But go ahead. No, no, I agree. I, I think you <coughs> talk about the, the IIPPA divide, if you want to call it that. Um, social media has brought this issue to the forefront uh, for some people and you know there's a lot of discussion inside the department about how we handle this and I would say from from the PA perspective you know and the three of us are a good example of this there's very much a role for all three parts of the the public diplomacy apparatus to play in social media and use it as a way to amplify their core mission. So from the PA perspective, my lane is communicating official policy messages in English, in foreign languages, doing it through social media, doing it through tradi traditional media, just doing it through media because traditional and new and social, those are gonna go away, it's all gonna be media. You know, IIP, engaging foreign audiences on a variety of issues about the US, about you know, other things. ECA, just like it says, Educational and Cultural Affairs Program. I think there's a lane for all three of us, and all three of us have a role to play using social media platforms, not just in English, but in other languages. That's how I would look at it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, um, the notion that there's not enough to go around for all of us to stay busy on a day-to-day -day basis, it, you know, it, it, is, is sort of false. You know, we really don't think about these things. Who does what on a day-to-day -day basis? We all have so much to do. Guess what? The world wants to hear what Secretary Clinton's saying. The world wants to hear what Secretary Clinton's saying. Maybe not the way she said it, but in a quicker fashion, 140 characters, a video. Um, and maybe they want to learn about the US, and they want to learn about what someone in West Virginia does for Valentine's Day. You know, in the same way, they also want to know what, how to get to the United States. How do I get a master's program? Um, so there's plenty to go around for, for all of us. Now, operationally, Matt brings up a good question, and he's an insider. He knows exactly, you know, he knows that we're, we're grappling with this. But the way I look at it is sort of like the publishing industry. You know, everyone thought magazines were going to be gone, toast. You know, with the advent of online, you know, where are they? What does it mean? What does it do? Has it been a hard transition? Are you still? Are we still trying to figure out who does what? Absolutely. Um, and that's a little bit of insider baseball. We're just trying to figure out who does what. Um, Matt also made an, you know reference to Smith Munt, which prohibits me from distributing any of my work products to domestic audiences. In an internet world, is that really relevant? I don't know. I'll let Congress decide that. Um, but uh, it is, it, you know, it is certainly we have all of our thing, all of our messages up on Facebook. It is our intent, 100%, to only talk to foreign citizens. Um, our messages are geared to foreign citizens, and you will notice that our, if an American read something that we did, they'd be like, I know, you know, or. That's not how I would read it. So we start from the get-go focusing on, on, on foreign citizens. And PA has a, you know, a dual purpose, both domestic and foreign, which frankly is sometimes harder. So you, you mentioned that everyone wants uh, to hear what Secretary Clinton has to say. Judging by what I've read in social networks, that's not entirely true. <laughs> um, and I, Maybe I'd it's also, aspirational for us. Yes. Uh, also, <laughs> uh, having read those same conversations, I can say that there's uh, perhaps equal or more interest and having Secretary Clinton hear them. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things that's come out of the discussions I participated in, or moderated, or watched, or you name it, here in DC, is seeing where and when US politicians are actually using these platforms themselves. Um, so, uh, Mindy Finn from Twitter estimated earlier this week that 15 to 20% of the Congress folks who are on, these, uh, on Twitter are actually using it themselves. Um, so uh, the, the classic joke in the Senate these days, if you want to see when a senator is tweeting, um, watch his aides, fingers on the Blackberry. Um, you know, and and I've, I've, you know, Senator McCain really does tweet himself. I've seen him do it, but I've also seen him literally talking on a panel while uh, the tweets are going up. Mm -hmm. right? So the, there, is a, there is a disconnect there in terms of personal use. Um, and with state, that's an interesting question. Now you, you three are re really you on Twitter. You, know, you, you are out on the edge of that. Um, what about leadership of state? Uh, you know, uh, does Secretary Clinton ever read tweets and log on? Um, and uh, follow-up question, uh, PJ Crowley famously was tweeting as a spokesperson. I don't think Victoria Newland is. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to take the first <coughs> part of that, I, I think where we're at right now, you know, you said the three of us, very obviously, if you look at our handles, it's us. 
you know, I was tweeting while I was getting ready for this this morning. Um, we're also of a, a demographic and sort of we've come up using these tools and we're comfortable with it. I think senior leadership are getting more and more comfortable with it. And as we move forward, you're going to see more and more people literally using this stuff themselves. I think an example right now is Ambassador McFall in Russia. He's tweeting. Like, it's him. You guys um, use at McFall. Check him yeah. out. M-C-F-A-U-L. Yeah. I mean, in English and in Russian, you know, and he's very interactive. As soon as he meets with somebody, he's tweeting. Um, you know, there are more and more senior people like that, and I think you'll see that continue moving forward. Um, in terms of uh, the prior spokesperson, PJ Crowley, Barry, you on Twitter all the time. Uh, I think, you know, the current spokesperson, I can't speak for her directly, but I, I think that, you know, we're moving in a way where we're, we're centralizing sort of who's talking. She's focused on the daily briefings mm -hmm. and, you know, responding to journalists' questions and helping to amplify the secretary's messaging and doing it sort of the way that we've, we've been going along the past few months, and, and that's what we're comfortable with at this point. Okay, just a couple of points. So you guys know, like, Chavez is on Twitter, right, in Venezuela? Chavez Candanga. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if you guys have read this, but he has like uh, allegedly a team of a couple hundred who are tweeting on his behalf. So I can assure you that nothing like that is happening at the State Department or any of our embassies, just as like a starting point, right? And I think just to kind of piggyback on what Ed was saying, you guys, who of you guys are on Twitter in a personal manner? Okay. I mean, this is a personal choice, right? It's a platform. I, I said in my remarks at the top that I hope are brief. I just talk too much in general. Um, but you know, you're comfortable with this, you're not, it's, it's not a place, if you're forced to be there, people who are like trying to listen to you are going to know that, right? That's going to be an ugly engagement. We are not using these, these tools because they're hot and flashy and we like to walk through the different verb tenses associated with the word tweet, right? We're much more interested in figuring out where the audiences live who care to engage with us and then doing so. There's a wrestling match going on in certain instances. On one side of the spectrum, you have you know, um, the Alec Rosses of the world or the Ambassador McFalls of the world who are, who are doing this. On others, it's, hey, do we put an institutional face there? Should we be a bureau on Twitter? Does that work? You know what I mean? So we're still trying to figure out this, this space. You know, we look to you guys as well to help us do this better. Um, when you see something that doesn't feel genuine or something, I mean, we all know that to make this stuff work, it's got to be authentic. Um, and I'll tell you what, like our ambassadors, before they go out, when they come back in the field, they are hearing about digital media um, and, and being asked to take a look at the, at the various platforms that we're managing to get a feel for it, whether they're already on it or not. I mean, this is a discussion that we're having with them. We're asking them to make the choice, you know, um, locally in terms of what makes most, most sense. But what we are asking them to do is figure out where those digital communities are in the countries you're going to have responsibility for and how to best engage with them. You know, so it's a wrestling match. I, I think we also acknowledge too that, uh, you know, whether you or I sign up for Twitter um, and whether the secretary signs up for Twitter, that's, those are two different things. I mean, what the secretary says matters. Um, and uh, it is... You say what we say doesn't matter? <laughs> I, I, no, I didn't say that at all, actually. <laughs> uh, and so I, I think that, yes, we are absolutely... I think, I think senior leadership will slowly move on, and they are. The, the, tr the trend is there. It's very clear. But to a degree, I mean, when the president and the secretary say something, even choosing one word versus another, it matters. And I'm not sure that necessarily lends itself to being authentic, because... Is she gonna? Is she gonna want to take that risk? Is the president want to take that risk? Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. Well, I mean, it, certainly. And be authentic at the we, same we've time. We've seen PJ continue to be quite authentic. Um, if you are following at PJ Crowley, you see he's, uh, I'd say, more plain spoken than he was as spokesperson, um, and that's very interesting to see that dynamic play out. Um, certainly, uh, the uh, secretary's boss um, has not been very active, but we do see more tweets signed uh, dash bo. And uh, notably, we saw him actually do his first presidential hangout. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no way to dodge uh, very effectively oh, in that space. Uh, it was, it, the, the, the thing that people who are interested um, in this world were watching is to see whether the kind of real-time engagement um, mediated by the internet, right, or through, through that platform, enabled uh, there to be um, unexpected outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, if you're managing uh, the official face of the White House or the State Department or any government agency, <coughs> some degree of um, 
predictability seems to be desirable. Put it that way. For the government, Alex. Yes, and, you're, and you're here process. to help. I understand. Uh, <laughs> so the, the the question though is, uh, in this context, uh, would you ever consider uh, doing hangouts um, and then broadcasting them globally as the kind of the next frontier? Oh yeah. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so, it, stay tuned soon. Soon. Okay, so I, 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 can, I can run a tweet saying that State Department will be doing a Google Plus Hangout soon. I think that, you know. Because they're going to they're do that in a sec. Dude, we, let's do we it. Wanna be, yeah. we let's do be, it. We want to do yeah, it. We want to be where the conversations are happening and on the platforms where people want to participate and engage. Okay. So if, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, you know, Google Plus to do a Hangout, we need to be in that space. If we're not in that space, we're missing out on a huge opportunity. Okay, uh, let's, let's keep rocking. We've, we've still got lots of questions and we've only got 15 minutes here. Uh, so let's see what we can do. Um, one of the interesting things else other parts of government are doing is trying to approach problem solving with something called open innovation. Other people call that crowdsourcing, right? Depends, whatever you call it, the idea is that um, you, you expose the kinds of uh, data of APIs, of, of the policy constraints, and then ask lots of people to help. Um, the exciting moment we're in is that social media plus the internet plus that data plus mobile devices allows us to do that in ways that just simply couldn't before. Um, do you ever see a time where the State Department would or could crowdsource a solution to a diplomatic or development question? So, great question. Um, you know, how do you show true listening, right? You act on it. You take it in, you consider it, you incorporate it into your solution. Um, the challenge, I think, in, in diplomacy, and, and you guys jump in, it's not just us acting. We are acting in the world with our partners, bilaterally, multilaterally, whatever it might be. So we are very excited to figure out spaces and opportunities to kind of take in um, ideas and opinions from our digital communities and implement them. But I mean, to be honest, I think that that's going to have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. When Ambassador Rice is behind closed doors of the Security Council, you know, it's not going to be a crowdsourced effort to uh, finalize the negotiation with Russia and China around Syria. Do you know what I mean? I mean, there, that's just a brutally honest statement. There are a lot of spaces, though, where that kind of input would be critical and welcome. I think, I think we're getting our footing. Uh, we're, we're starting out on what we would consider things like, like what do we bring into our American spaces? Books, DVDs, you know, events. What kind of people do you want to talk to? We're starting out there where we're all comfortable doing that. Um, I think that uh, our, our former ambassador in India took the next step and he said, tell me where you want me to travel. Tell me, yeah. you know, tell me who you want to meet with in those places. That's the next step. So I think our envoys, our officials are getting there. Um, but whether or not it comes down to that, that Security Council decision where you're like, hey, what do you guys think? TBD. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> when, we, when we crowdsourced questions for the spokesperson, you know, we're saying, what issues do you care about? What do you want to hear from the State Department? Um, you, what do you want, want to know about our policy and in what languages? So I think we're getting there. We're not all the way there. I think there's an immense amount of potential just given the way uh, countries and you know, foreign affairs agencies interact with each other. The diplomatic solution crowdsourcing is very difficult for reasons that my two colleagues just pointed out. I think on the development side, there is an immense amount of potential there. And I know, you know people at USAID are also thinking about these yep. issues. And, and uh, Raj Shah from USAID is on Twitter. And sure. they just you know, hosted mm -hmm. a, a forum from the White House with a chat about this exact mm -hmm. sort of di direction. So there is a lot of interest. Um, I think the, the next question we can leave for our future panel will be outcomes. And I know that there's a lot of interest in here about outcomes, so we'll sort of try to get back to some of that. Um, there, there is an interesting question here that came in um, from Terrio, uh, and it, I think it's an important one. Um, do you think the ability for folks in the U.S. to hear in real time about government brutality in places like Syria via tweets from those under attack hastens the U.S. government to act in some way? <coughs> I would say that getting more information faster on any issue uh, where we have direct concerns will obviously help the formulation of a decision and help us to move further along because if you don't know what's going on, it's very difficult to decide how to move forward. So whether it's from uh, on the ground in a place like Syria or if it's other issues, the faster we have information to make a, a well-informed decision, the better I think it is. 
I, I'm not sure it hastens it, but it certainly, I think, makes the decision better. Because I think under an old model, as you knew what was going on, then there was an information gap, and then you made decisions, and you didn't know what was going on. I think today, our decisions are, are based on that immediate data. So, so our decisions, I think, are better. Whether they're faster or not, I don't know. I don't have the, the data to actually prove that one way or another. But I do think that our decisions are better and more reflective of what is happening on the ground. Covered. Great. So uh, I mean, it's certainly uh, pretty clear, and, and alluded to this when we started the, the panel, started the event, that uh, the internet is acting as a platform for collective action now. When people are very uh, motivated about something, they can find other people who are t t discussing it, and then um, potentially take that uh, coordinated action offline. And um, the, the interesting dynamic, I think, uh, that certainly I'll be watching, is whether um, US citizens are able to use these platforms to collectively ask you all to do things. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent is the State Department listening or able to listen, willing to listen, um, to what uh, the public is asking for? Uh, certainly, uh, the White House is quite a node mm -hmm. of angst mm -hmm. at times, if you ever look <coughs> at their chats. Um, Congress is. Um, Congress, I think, is right at the bottom, unfortunately, of, of institutions that have uh, public approval at the moment. Um, can state, sh should state respond to the American public on social media? It actually goes back to Mount Runner's question a little bit earlier. You know, who has the authorities under the current sort of um, uh, framework of Smith Month to engage with the American public, right? Um, clearly, we can all be listening. Um, and then, what are we sort of authorized to do in terms of actions? From our perspective in educational and cultural affairs, you know, it's a, it's a much more um, limited um, and, and very positive um, um, space to be in discussion with the American people. Uh, we are engaging with them directly around um, trying to encourage, you know, American families to host uh, exchange students who are coming here, right? I mean, it's, it's more that kind of thing. Um, and when we do, you know, f so the space that we're in with them from like a relational um, perspective is one that, you know, hey, we're, we're looking for um, an exchange student. We want to host a group coming through. It's, it's much more on that sort of um, grassroots public diplomacy effort. Um, and again, they're also, in as far as we are supporting Americans who go abroad and participate in exchanges, we welcome their comments in our alumni circles around policy-related topics. And certainly, we're watching their comments there. But this is all more in the space of a comfortable discussion, I would put it, as opposed to an urgent sort of emergency. So discussions in this space aren't going to be comfortable sometimes. Um, uh, and they may not even occur, depending upon which countries that you're trying to have them in. Um, Iran has famously cut a lot of the connection internally. Um, other countries um, are less tolerant uh, for different reasons and in different contexts for uh, certain discussions. Um, that said, how important is it for the State Department uh, to be participating in conversations on other social media platforms? And I take this question right here from Twitter. From uh, A. Wozniak 711, uh, and let's see if I've got a name attached to that. Yes, Amy Wozniak. Um, besides Google Plus Hangouts, you know, what is State doing on local social media sites like Weibo and SciWorld, where foreign audiences are? A lot. China. Tons. A lot. Okay. And is China letting your account stay up? Because Nick Kristoff got in Weibo and he got knocked off. We're good. We we in China we engage millions of people every single day. Um, in our cumulative it, properties in China have like 2.5 million followers. Mm -hmm. That are run out of the I embassy. I mean, I mentioned educational advising. That's <coughs> happening via microblogs in China right now, just by way of example. So, yeah, and that's, that's up and, and going. It's not just China, it's Russia, it's Brazil. Mm -hmm. it, it is, yeah, I mentioned earlier, but we are on the platform where the people are. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not dedicated to Facebook or to Twitter because, you know, they'll be around tomorrow, but who knows what will be around a year or two years. So, you're on V-Contact. We are on V-Contact, yeah. Okay. Korea, too. Mm -hmm. You know. The, the predominant local platforms in almost every country, we have some sort of presence. Do you have any foreign service officers who are engaging with the StarCraft community? Oh my god, I don't know what that is. We're I'm so embarrassed. Not that okay. I know. Uh, Let's that, put that, that on that, that that's a, that's a, uh, that's a <laughs> reference to, uh, <laughs> uh, to, if you don't know, uh, um, got South me. Korea's got one of the most uh, wired populations on Earth. Oh, okay. And StarCraft is a very, very popular video game there. Um, that, that actually is covered and treated much like professional sports are here. Ah. So, so something for Yosu. Yeah. Uh, so some, something to look forward to. And, and I, I guess I could go and ask you about um, uh, World of Warcraft another time, too. Uh, another, another we'll come time better there. prepared. Yeah, that's, that's right. And we'll in costume. Now. Right. <laughs> now, I, um, there, there were a couple stats, and I want to share them with the audience here um, that I got uh, during the panel, um, just because just stats are fun. 
Um, the U.S. Department of State and U.S. Embassies and Consulates <coughs> manages 125 YouTube channels with 23,940 subscribers and 12,729,885 million video views. So that's a lot. Um, 195 Twitter accounts with 1.4 million followers. 288 Facebook pages with 7.5 million fans. Also, uh, the Department of State maintains a presence on Flickr, Tumblr, Google+, maintains content for its official blog, Dipnote. Um, other embassies and consulates maintains presences on uh, these social media platforms. And uh, currently producing content in 11 languages, Arabic, Chinese, Farsi, French, English, Hindi, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, Turkish, and Urdu. In addition, many embassies are tweeted in local languages, including German, Indonesian, Korean, and Thai. I wanted to do the stat dump because I think that's interesting, and they were talking about what else is out there. I didn't see that in, in that mention that uh, the local platforms. Um, can you well list? Well underreported, I yeah. I know. I mean, the story is like <laughs> so yeah. much bigger than that. It, it is. I mean, I, it, that's very, you know, to be frank, it's a little Washington focused. Um, but uh, it, uh, you know, because what our, what our folks are doing on the ground is, is, is in, you know, dozens and dozens of languages across many, many more platforms. Um, so I think we'll have to get you guys a more holistic look at things. But I mean, yeah. that's a good story, right? Mm -hmm. It is good. It's damn good, actually, considering well, where we were a couple years ago. It's a start. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're, uh, we're here. I think we've got four minutes left. And I know, gather there's an event coming in after us. Yes. So New America is saying, yes, please, wrap this up. Um, closing thoughts. Um, what's next for social media at the State Department in terms of what you need to do to do your job better? Um, metrics, right? I think that's the, the theme here. Um, you know, I, I had like sort of the bus ride home the other day. We don't have the full answer to this, but my bus ride home, my thought was, damn, I'm so glad to be hearing that number, that word toss around more metrics and analysis is what it's all about. Why did that put a smile on my face on a bus ride home? Because public diplomacy <coughs> is a hard space to assess from a quantitative standpoint. Social media, I think, is helping us get there in a little bit better way. How did we used to do it? Um, what's the readership of the main daily in um, Peru, in Lima, Peru? Do you know what I mean? Can we prove that everybody actually picked up their paper and opened it? Absolutely not. Did we change um, an opinion by running an op-ed by our ambassador? Who knows, really? Um, so I think it's an imperfect sort of you know space to sort of put metrics around, but social media is helping us get there, and there's a big focus on that. Uh we have a mandate to talk to as many people as possible, and that's not just elites, and that's not just people in government. Uh, and that comes from the secretary on down, and she's dead serious. Um, so I think that uh, what we need to do, though, is work on, in addition to metrics, which are incredibly important, training for our staff. Yeah. We have a lot of people out there that, that don't know it, that are of a different generation or are young and don't know it. It, you know, it doesn't matter. But the expectation that they, that they do know how to operate on social media is there. Um, so we're getting our ducks aligned to make sure that we support them in the way that we can support them. And then from a Washington perspective, which our folks are like, oh, we don't need Washington, but we're trying to provide global services. So enterprise-wide metrics, enterprise-wide um, uh, research and evaluation, training, those types of things. Uh, so we're definitely moving in the right direction, and we're moving quicker than I've ever seen the government. I'd say more, more engagement moving beyond broadcast, more engagement in more languages, and uh, also trying to create more useful content from a video perspective, especially whether it's with subtitles or smaller clips, both for media and for people to replicate on social media properties to sort of feed our posts overseas, stuff that's timely that they can use, uh, and you know, also the metrics and the training. So more to come on all of those, I think, in the next year. Thank you all. Uh, you know, you've got some interesting questions, so I appreciate yeah, your great. taking shots Thank at the you. answers. Uh, thanks to everyone here for attending, for asking Thank questions. Uh, thanks to our online audience. Uh, thanks to New America for hosting us. Um, and uh, again, thanks to all of you for participating. I hope you'll uh, continue to engage these folks online. Great. Thanks. Al. Thank you.